Okay, Alexander, we've got uh, the news of the UK destroyer and the Russian fighter jets buzzing that destroyer in the Black Sea. This is, uh, this is, what a story. This is, to be quite honest, we have videotape of, uh, of that incident as well, of the Russian jets buzzing that destroyer. We have um, the Russians saying that the, uh, the destroyer, the UK ship, was entering Russian waters off, uh, off the coast of Crimea. We have the UK saying that they don't recognize Crimea as part of Russia, hence they weren't entering Russian waters. And um, we have a BBC journalist on that destroyer just by chance. Go figure that on the very ship that causes this incident, we happen to have a BBC journalist on that ship. Alexander, get into this story. What the hell is going on? All of this, of course, follows the uh, Biden-Putin summit. The the fact that uh, from, from a video we did the other day, the fact that it looks like the Biden White House is starting to distance itself from Ukraine and getting weapons to Ukraine. We have the UK, though, giving weapons and training to Ukraine. And we also have the EU uh, trying to to approach Russia and figure out a way for uh, rapprochement and figuring out their differences. So here we have the UK, though. It looks like it's, it's trying to stir up trouble, it seems. I don't know. What, what do you make of this? It is trying to stir up trouble. Now, the fact that the BBC journalist is on a warship. BBC journalists do not routinely go on warships. This was deliberately staged provocation. The media was supposed to be there. It was supposed to be seen by the world that there would be some sort of incident involving the Russian Navy. And all of this is happening at exactly the time when the United States is now trying to talk to the Russians about pre establishing a predictable and stable relationship with Russia and Europe so that they can refocus on China. When Merkel and Macron are talking about setting up an EU summit with Russia, the British are out in the cold. So what this is, partly it is to try to gain attention because London is extremely unhappy at the way in which it has been frozen out of all the diplomatic initiatives. That is one. But the second thing they want to do is, if they possibly can, they want to derail this process. They want to derail the process, firstly, by... Um, if they can, staging an incident of this nature in the Black Sea. And secondly, they want to re-emphasise the relationship between the West and Ukraine, which, as you rightly say, is beginning to look increasingly tattered and in which Britain is now heavily invested and is looking increasingly like the only remaining major Western ally that continues to believe in this enterprise. So this is a deliberately staged provocation. I I predict that behind the scenes, the Germans, the French and indeed the Americans will be very angry because from their point of view, the last thing they want is the British behaving in this way. But as I said, that it was a provocation. The fact that there was a BBC journalist there, that is that puts it beyond doubt. What does the UK have to gain from this, though, Alexander? I'm trying to figure out what's the angle. OK, they want attention. They want to create this provocation. They're upset that uh, they're being cut out of the loop. But you did a video on your channel the other day saying that the UK is now considering perhaps uh, having a summit with Putin, which se seems very logical. If you ask me, they're, they're starting to, uh, to create some sort of foreign policy on their own as a sovereign nation. What, what, why do you need this provocation? That's my first question. What do you really have to gain from this? And my second question is, why is the UK still holding on to this Ukraine experiment, this Ukraine Frankenstein project that has gone terribly wrong, when even the United States, even Biden, a man who was running Ukraine for many years under Obama, seems to be abandoning the country. The EU seems to already abandon the country. Uh, you have Nord Stream 2. What more of a sign do you need than Nord Stream 2 for Ukraine to understand that Europe is done with you? Why is the UK still holding on? I, I don't understand. What's, what's their, uh, what do they have to gain from holding on to the Ukraine experiment?
Right, the first thing to say is that I think Britain gains absolutely nothing from this affair. As you absolutely rightly say, there are some indications that some perhaps wiser heads within the British government are actually trying to sort things out with the Russians. I mean, Dominic Raab took, uh, put, picked up the telephone and called Sergei Lavrov. The first time a British minister has done that in years. He got completely chewed out, but at least it was an effort. And the Defence Secretary was floating the idea of a summit meeting between Johnson and Putin. So you, there are two possible theories. Theory one is that this was all sloppiness and incompetence. People weren't uh, hadn't caught up with exactly what was going on. And and uh, the orders that were uh, given to the uh, ship had not been changed and that the ship was sent there. So with the decision to send the ship there was sent some days ago, some weeks ago before the shift in British policy took place and the orders hadn't yet been transmitted to change course. Um, that is a view which I had run with initially, by the way. But the second view, which I think now is looking more plausible, is that, in fact, this was a provocation set up by some people within the British political system who are not happy about this kind of provocation which we are seeing. Now, the British will always say that they have a joined-up government and that it isn't the case that people, you know, you have rogue elements within it that act against the interests of the Prime Minister or the decisions of the Prime Minister. Don't believe that for a microsecond. London, like every other capital, has has its own different uh, factions and the fact that a BBC journalist was on this ship makes it pretty clear to me that there was obviously a decision made by someone right at the very last moment to send the ship as close to Sevastopol as possible in the hope that this would create a provocation. So that's what it looks like. My impression also is that the dominant faction in the British government, the johnson Rab faction, if you like, are deeply embarrassed by this affair. And it's been interesting that Downing Street tried to play it down. They pretended that there had not been an incident with the Russians at all, that the Russians hadn't fired warning shots, that the aircraft hadn't been buzzing over the ships. Well, of course, we now have seen the pictures and we can see that that was what indeed did took place. So why are the British still so obsessively invested in Ukraine? Well, for me, one of the things that I find extremely puzzling about British policy and have done for a long time now is why they are so obsessed with Russia in general. Now, I don't think they're interested in Ukraine very much, but they are extremely interested. They are obsessed with Russia. They see Russia as this great adversary, this great enemy. Perhaps at some level, they flatter themselves by thinking that they're a great power, by taking on a great power in this way. Uh, sort of David and Goliath battle, I think all that they're doing is irritating and annoying everyone, but they are they remain fixated with Russia. You only have to go to the British media to see that. To give an example, just one example amongst many, not a single British newspaper spoke warmly about the summit meeting in Geneva between Biden and Putin. And the most anti-Russian British newspaper of all, The Guardian, hasn't even published an editorial about it. It's too upset that the summit it took place to actually report it in its editorial pages, which is really astonishing. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to see that things like that taking place. So this is what I think it is. There is a British fixation with Russia, uh, um, a huge anger that the British have towards the Russians. I suspect because back in the 1990s, the British massively invested in trying to develop influence there. They got very close to all kinds of Russian oligarchs like Hodorkovsky and Berezovsky. They established all sorts of networks there. They had all of those completely unraveled and taken apart by the Russians in the 2000s. And they've never got over it. And they still have this obsessive uh, loathing for the country, which is driving them mad. Because this incident, by the way, is on a, on the facts. It's straight. It's straightforwardly mad. I mean, it, getting you're sending a warship into Sevastopol 
at this time is, is, is a lunatic idea. And whoever was responsible, well, frankly, should be nowhere near exercising power. That's all I will say. Okay, final questions. Um, did Boris know about this, do you think? Number one, did he actually know about this or was this done kind of behind his back? You, you touched upon it, but uh, I'd like maybe you can uh, go a little bit deeper into that. And number two is where do we go from here? Where does the UK go from here? What's what's next? Where How does Russia treat uh, the UK going forward? How does the US or Europe uh, deal with the UK if, if the UK wants to? I don't want to say go rogue, but... Um, I don't know. It seems like they are breaking away from the uh, consensus, which appears now, and it just appears now. The consensus is, what, like you said, to try and fix things with Russia, even temporarily, two, three months while they focus on China. I don't know. Where, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, they are going rogue, and we'll come to that in a moment. What did Boris know? Goodness knows what Boris knew. Boris is one of these people who, as I said, he's no manager. He's got very skilled tactical skills as a politician, and he's got very strong political instincts. But he's never somebody who's run, a, uh, you know, a, a joined-up government. And uh, it's quite possible that he listens to one person one day one and a different person the next day. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on this one. And, you know, I know there's going to be lots of people who are going to disagree with me, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to guess that this wasn't done with his knowledge. And the reason I say that is because Downing Street was so obviously embarrassed by what happened because they were, as I said, trying to pretend for many hours that this incident never took place. Now, when they talk in that way instead of, you know, saying, you know, that the Russians are acting in an appalling fashion and that this is, you know, a sign of Russian aggressiveness. When they're trying to play down an incident like this, it seems to me that it's most likely that the prime minister himself wasn't informed. But that's a guess. I, I can't be sure. And as I said, I'm sure there's a lot of other people who will disagree and who will contradict me in saying that. Now, Going about Britain going rogue, can I say something? The Germans and the French at this moment in time, for their own reasons, nobody has turned around. Nobody's suddenly decided that, you know, they want things to be nice with Russia. None of no minds have been changed about Mr. Putin and the feelings that the Western powers have towards him. But for tactical reasons, at this particular moment in time, they want to improve relations with Russia, at least to some degree. Not because, as I said, they've learned to love the country, but because they're getting absolutely scared, spooked by the fact that it is becoming an ally of China. They want to try and find some means of drawing it away from China. They want to try and focus instead on China. And the Germans and the French want to set up this EU summit meeting. The Americans apparently are backing this hard. Blinken has been around picking up the phones, talking to the Baltic states, talking to the Poles, telling them not to object. And the Americans are also obviously trying to talk to the Russians themselves. I think the Americans are going to be furious with the British over this. I think the Europeans are going to be furious with the British about this. And I'm going to make another observation, which is that Contrary to what I think many people think, I'm pretty sure that the neocons in Washington will not have put the British up to this. Because the one thing no person in official positions in Washington ever wants to see is America's allies behaving, especially America's European allies, behaving in a way that conflicts with U.S. foreign policy. Now, if it had been Donald Trump in office, I would have said that obviously this was a plot hatched between London and the hardliners in Washington. But with Joe Biden in office, I am pretty sure that even the most hardline anti-Russian neocon figures in the U.S. government are furious with the British over this incident. They will say you will never do this kind of thing again without our permission and our agreement in advance. Okay, well, we'll continue to monitor this uh, story, yeah, I imagine. Um, it's I, I, it's come to a conclusion, I imagine. There's not... Oh, no, no that's right. I mean, the, 
for no, him. I mean, that's it. The, the, the Russians, again, as befits a true great power, have played this very cool. They drove the ship away. They sent their ships there. They sent their aircraft there. They drove the, the, uh, 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 the um, ship away. They calling in the British ambassador, and as far as they're concerned, the incident after that is closed, and the British will be left to sulk and stew in their in their own juices, as we like to say in Britain. I'm going to just make one final observation. If I'm wrong, if I am absolute, if I am, if I'm wrong about one thing, if this was a plot hatched between the the, neo, the British and the neocons in Washington then we are in serious trouble because it turns out that even the Democrats can't control the neocons and can't control the US government anymore. In which case, as I said, you can bring on a war because it's only a question of time before it happens. I'm again going to make the assumption that it was the British acting on their own. All the indications suggest it. But, you know, again, if I'm wrong about this, God help us. <laughs> right. I agree. I'll wrap it up there. I will say that if uh, the British acted on their own, then this is a one off and uh, the British will be reprimanded by the United States and will continue to move forward with whatever this foreign policy is over the next three, four months. Reprochement with Russia, um, taking on China. If it is coordinated between the United States and the British, then yes, we are going to some sort of war. That is that is clear. Alexander Rickers, thank you very much, guys. Alexander's traveling, so if the picture is a little, a little, you know, broken up here and there, no worries. We'll be back to normal next week. And um, Duran Shop, ten percent off Real News, and go to our locals page as well and let us know your thoughts as to what happened in this incident in the Black Sea. Take care.